Well, hello again there, friends and neighbors. Mike Tro for the Saline County Libertarian Party back on the Weatherman Show. I think I need to, to stop and, and, and do a, a little, a little uh, promo here or just a disclaimer on my part. No, this show is not connected in any ways with, with Bill Ayers of the 60s radical group. That's Barack Obama. That's not me. Okay? Uh, I have a lot of people asking me that. A lot of them are, are doing it in jest, I understand. But I do want to just make sure that, no, the whole point of the name The Weatherman is just like a meteorologist. Here comes a storm, and we need to look out for it. That's what it's about. I'll do that on, on today's show. Well, since they let me in this building, and Aaron's went to all the trouble of getting things set up for me, I might as well go ahead and do a show, right? Okay. Well, I've had a lot of fun this, this month. And, and I listened to 71st District Representative Diana Dirks. Wait a minute. What's that picture doing on there? That's not Diana Dirks. How did I get on there? Oh, well, okay. Let's, let's move on here. Anyway, I heard Representative Dirks make the, this comment that she loves meeting her constituents. Yet, they weren't in Topeka uh, for the League of Women Voters Day at the Capitol. We didn't see anybody. Well, now look, this is our day, our special day to hobnob with the elite of the, of the Kansas political class. Well, what did the legislature do? The legislature, the day before we, we got there, adjourned and took off for a, a week. So they weren't around. Perhaps they didn't want to be around the, as Secretary of State Chris Kobach called us, the communists, like the League of Women Voters. Yati Abakula, and I want to apologize. I'm sure I butchered your, your name, sir. I mean no disrespect to you, I, I assure you. But he is a writer for the Kansas City Star, and on February the 26th, he wrote this. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach masked his constant stomp out the vote moves by saying he wants people to prove their citizenship. Unfortunately for Mr. Kobach, he, he's been, been making a living off of this, this canard. He has provided no proof that any Kansas election has been rigged stolen, or otherwise tampered with to any meaningful degree. His recent smattering of lawsuits against supposed illegal voters <coughs> shows how flimsy his contentions are about election fraud, and judges have not ruled favorably on some of his efforts. Let me end the author's comments here to add a point of my own. Mr. Kobach, if you are so in favor of fair elections, why have you not been supporting and encouraging Beth Clarkson in her efforts? She wants fair elections. Mr. Abahoka discusses Kobach referring to both the American Civil Liberties Union and the League of Women Voters as communists. The ACLU has a long history of working for left-wing causes and only occasionally only occasionally standing up for gun owners or Christians just to show they are impartial. That's why I eliminated a lot of the author's story. The important thing here is to remember is people use that kind of vitriolic language when they themselves have ran out of arguments and so they just name call. The League of Women Voters was started to educate women on voting and has increased its spectrum to include all sorts of topics. This year, we're focusing on education, and here locally, the topic of water issues has been primary. I need to add, I am a member of the local board of uh, the League of Women Voters, so I kind of have an inside look on this. this. I was upset in Topeka, though, when we were there. 
I was there for an hour and a half. And I said so also. I said so. You know, been there for an hour and a half, sitting with a group of communists, as Kobach calls us, and no one used that most communistic of terms once. Comrade. As the Lawrence Journal World reported, Kobach said, the ACLU and her fellow communist friends, the League of Women <coughs> Voters, and you can quote me on that, he said, the Communist League of Women Voters, the ACLU and the Communist League of Women Voters sued, Kobach said, making sure that reporters in the room heard him. Sure. The ACLU is a favorite enemy of ultra-conservatives like Kobach because of how it challenges the power of government. Yet, it has fought police misconduct and battled for freedom of speech. <coughs> you know, just like good communists would do. As for piling on the League of Women Voters, really, folks, here's what the, the Kansas branch does. We are a nonpartisan grassroots volunteer and political organization with eight local leagues across the state. For 93 years, we have encouraged the informed and active participation of citizens in government and have influenced public policy through education and advocacy. Ooh, nothing screams communist like a group that wants to help people vote in a democratic process. Right, Chris? End quote. <coughs> Let me say, as I sat at the table at the, the board, of, the local board <laughs> says, are there Democrats? Yes. Are there Republicans? Yes. I wouldn't call any of them communists, and I know I'm not a communist. So, I, I don't know, Chris. I just, I, I don't know, but wait. With all this talk here of Kobach, something is rising in me. It's rising. It's, it's, it's the spirit of Joseph McCarthy. Yes, there once was a senator named McCarthy seeking fame. He did create anarchy. He yelled and he shouted and he blamed. And his opposition did exclaim, yes, Many lost their jobs, and many more did sob. Until that day, in his briefcase, we could see he was bad, because no proof was there. Just a fifth of old granddad. Yes, McCarthy was his name, and blame was his game. Because how else could a nobody gain fortune and fame? <coughs> Let's get serious here for a second. What's really at the heart of the attack on the league is described by Barbara Shelley's writing on Paul McCartney's 73rd birthday. That's June 18th, 2015, for those of you who don't know. I begin the, the quote. <coughs> Brownback this month signed a law that funds the state's court system for the next two years. At first blush, that looks like good news. But the funding depends on the Kansas Supreme Court ruling the way the legislature wants it to in a certain case. The wrong decision would prompt a reevaluating of the entire judiciary budget, says Senator Jeff King, vice president of the state senate and chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Wow. Just wow. The Kansas legislature is using funding for the court system as a club to coerce the state's highest court into a ruling it finds favorable. And that's Barbara Shelley, and she writes in the Kansas City Star. Wait a minute. I, I feel a song coming on, on me here. A song about court packing. Court packing, I say court packing, it's what you're trying to do. Court packing, yes, court packing, it didn't work for Roosevelt and it won't work for you. 
even the Salina Journal. Yeah, the journal got in on it. On March the 8th, a story entitled Tactical Maneuver appeared. The point of the story is how the Republican lawmakers are struggling with the courts and their consistent opposition. It is pointed out that the Republicans hold a three to one advantage over the Democrats in the legislature. Now, I've had some fun with the court packing aspects of their desires because it smacks of changing the rules if the rules don't allow you to do what you want to do. The article also discusses impeachment of the court or changes rules to make it easier to impeach. <coughs> this is what happens when too many people of the same thought patterns all get together. It's called inbreeding, folks. We need to break up the Republican club by voting in some libertarians and, yeah, maybe even a couple of Democrats, too. We need to pay attention to the judges this year. This is a weatherman alert. We need to pay attention to the, the judges. Whether you support Brownback's direction or not is not the question. It does not matter. This is about an independent judiciary. Okay, now, on to other items. We hear Democrats constantly complaining about the electoral system. Sally Cohn, in her February 23rd, 2016 CNN editorial, spoke of the Democratic superdelegate system. This is a system that accounts for 15% of the total delegate vote. <coughs> they are made up of, of party insiders, ex-presidents, vice presidents, chair, et cetera, et cetera, the truly committed Democrats. The point here is to keep the voters from getting too much power. Her words, not mine, her words. Matt Rising enforces Cohn's comments in his writing, the undemocratic Democratic primary. Superdelegates are made up of party insiders, like presidents, vice presidents. Can you imagine Bill Clinton not voting for Hillary? Ew hate to be around them. They can vote however they desire, and they are turning out in large numbers for, for Clinton. Now, I was at the Coxes here in Saline County, and we'll talk about them on the next show. And I saw what I saw. The Bernie forces are, are large and loud, but they are being overcame by the superdelegate system of insiders. So I don't want to hear about the Electoral College and popular vote. If your primary caucus system is this much askew, then why even support that party? Why bother to even vote? Well, the answer to that question is because that's how you get rid of a system like this, is by voting it out. Of course. Little Debbie Wasserman Schultz explained it all the way to Rachel Maddow by saying the Democrat system is meant to stifle votes of the common people. And this is good. Aw, ain't that sweet. The common people don't have to, to know what they're doing. The brave insider group of the party will balance it out. I remember when this system was, was created. The whole point of it was to have the people have a greater share of the decision-making process. Bring it out of the smoke-filled rooms and into the light of the ballot box. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. The insiders don't have to vote for either one. Just like in the good old days. Oh, just like normal people. And people vote for this party. Why? Well, onwards. And upwards we go. <coughs> We've heard a, a great deal of discussion about democratic socialism. So we need to ask, <laughs> just what is democratic socialism? Sounds very good. But we need to understand it better before we make our decision. Is it as good as it sounds, or is it smoke and mirrors? 
Check out this video. Socialism. Seems like a scary word, but a recent poll shows a majority of millennials don't even know what it means. So why is presidential candidate and time traveler Doc Brown advocating for something the older generation fears and the younger generation doesn't know anything about? Because he's not. He's using the term democratic socialism, which means something else entirely. What's the difference? Let's explore in this episode of Long Form. Whether you agree with Bernie Sanders' political views or not, it's important for Americans to understand the difference between traditional socialism and democratic socialism. It seems a lot of people are just hearing the socialism part of the phrase and immediately prepping their underground bunkers. So let's first break down what socialism is. First off, it's not communism, and this is what a lot of people equate it with. Communism is an extreme form of socialism, just like fascism and monarchism are extreme forms of conservatism. I know. Lots of words, but the point is, there are extreme parts of any political party, and socialism does not automatically equal communism. What it does equal is the idea that people should run a country, and not big businesses, banks, and corporations. It also says that the society should be a place where all people work as equals in cooperation for the common good. More extreme versions of socialism advocate that free markets and money should not exist, that people should be working for the good of the men and women in their community. Now, despite what Fox News and the conservative party might have you believe, this is not what democratic socialism is. Democratic socialism is socialism through the ballot box that says changes in the government and society should be through fair elections. Democratic socialism also says that the basic foundations of a society should be provided for through the government so that the people of that state can have a happy, healthy life. It does not do away with free markets, private businesses, or your freedom. Unsurprisingly, it's already playing a huge part in our country and you may not even realize it. Some of the most obvious are things like Medicare and Social Security. But people don't realize that the reason we have a military, national parks, prisons and the whole justice system, public transportation, disposal of your toilet waste, garbage collection, firefighters, police officers, and even the roads you drive on are because of democratic socialism. And the Republican Party, who has recently been calling out Bernie Sanders' ideas as un-American, perhaps don't realize that the thing they love most right now border protection, is also a democratic socialist program. The most impactful of these programs, I would argue, is that democratic socialism is the reason why every single child in this country has the right to get an education through high school and not pay a dime. But let's look at the flip side really quick. These programs do take money, and because the government would have to pay for them, it would have to increase taxes in some way. In countries successfully implementing the programs Bernie Sanders is advocating for, like universal health care and free public college tuition, taxes are higher, especially on the upper class. But because of these taxes, they don't have to pay for things like going to the hospital or getting an education. They don't have premiums or student debt. They have a more equal distribution of wealth and generally a higher standard of living. So it's time we get rid of the stigma around socialism and look at the actual individual policies being proposed. Do we agree with them? If you don't, that's okay, but at least you know what you're voting against come election time, and not just advocating blindly against a phrase you might not understand. In this video, we hear a lot of terms. Oh, we ain't socialists, and we definitely aren't communists. We aren't extremists. Socialists believe people should run society not corporations, and democratic socialists believe that should be done through the ballot box. I'm really not sure if this slide is completely correct, as I would combine the Republicans and the Democrats, because their philosophy is pretty much the same. That foundations of society should be funded through government, which means higher taxes. But life is so good in these kind of, of areas. Look at Sweden. Sweden, first of all, is a small homogenous nation. You have to equate Sweden with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in order to get equality here. Not the U.S. The Mormon Church has an enforced 15% tithe on its members that is used for people in need. Who's your job? Go to the center council. They'll take care of you. Need an operation? They'll take care of you. In that size, you are going to get a consensus, and any citizens that don't want it can leave at any time. 
Now, we must ask, has any non-political American citizen ever advocated democratic socialism? Dr. Martin Luther King, looking at the situation of the poor in this country, made this comment. Call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all of God's children. <coughs> in 1966, he confided to his staff, you can't talk about solving the economic problem of the Negro without talking about billions of dollars. You can't talk about ending the slums without first saying profit must be taken out of the slums. You're really tampering and getting on dangerous ground because you're messing with folks then. You're messing with captains of industry. Now this means that we are treading in difficult water because it really means that we are saying that something is wrong with capitalism. There must be a better distribution of wealth and maybe America must move toward a democratic socialism. <coughs> in holding these views, King followed in the footsteps of many prominent, influential Americans whose views and activism changed the country for the better. In the 1890s, a socialist Baptist minister, Francis Bellamy, wrote the Pledge of Allegiance, and a socialist poet, Catherine Lee Bates, penned America the Beautiful. King was part of a proud tradition that includes such important 20th century figures as Jane Addams, Eugene Debs, Florence Kelly, John Dewey, Upton Sinclair, Helen Keller, W.E.B. Du Bois, Albert Einstein, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and Walter Ruther. And thusly comes Bernie Sanders, the kindly old gentleman that speaks loftily of curing the ills of America. Before we feel the burn, let's get into what the democratic socialists of America say. <coughs> These questions and answers are from the Democratic Socialists of America website. Let's do the question and answer thing. First question, what is democratic socialism? Democratic socialists believe that the economy and society should be ran in a democratic manner to meet public needs, not to make a profit for the few. Many structures of our government and society must be radically transformed. Second question, doesn't socialism mean that the government will own and run everything? Answer, democratic socialists do not want to create an all-powerful government, but neither have all-powerful corporations. Social and economic decisions should be made by those most affected. <coughs> Here's a statement from Dan Errol from Bloomberg News. True socialism would replace capitalism. Democrat socialists would place more controls on corporations and owners. Okay, I've got a whole lot more information, but I'd just be repeating myself. Support of democratic socialism comes in the guise of helping the poor. Those who are feeling the burn talk about free education free health care, etc. Look, Bernie Sanders comes across as a nice enough guy. His personal history of social activism means he believes what he says. But the problem with his philosophy is it is attempting to do through the police power of the state what social Darwinism did without government activities. Democratic socialists mistrust the power of people in business but trust the power of people in government. Your money is no longer yours because the government has the right to regulate your finances. There are two things that I believe libertarians would agree with democratic socialists on. One, corporate welfare allows corporations to act inappropriately and survive in the world. And two, People should work for the joy of their job. A difference here being that libertarians believe in an individual's ability to make it on their own. 
And anything too easily obtained by us is too quickly given away. A person who is not working for the sheer joy of working will not work as hard. So for us, democratic socialism is full of happy thoughts, but not a lot of solid achievement. Why don't we take the force out of it, explain to people and convince them? What I hear is they threaten us with the police power of the state if we don't go along. They tell us how much they are taking from our paychecks. There is only the consent of the ballot box. Well, they tried this in Venezuela, and that nation is on the verge of civil war because the democratic socialists in power won't yield to the power of the ballot box. People want capitalism back. In socialism, or even democratic socialism, people stop trying to better themselves. Why should I work harder? I won't get the advantages of my labor. I'll be given everything. The drive to create ends. In a utopia, people would continue to work hard. But this is not a utopia. <coughs> well, this month, folks, I'm going to begin introducing you to the Libertarian Party presidential candidates. I'll do three this month, and I'll do three next month. Okay? First up, as a 2012 Libertarian presidential candidate, Gary Johnson. Watch his video now. I'm Governor, I'm Governor Gary, Gary Johnson. 80% of you have stated you want a third choice in 2016, and now you have one in me. Those of you worried your vote will be wasted, I say every vote you've cast in every election has been a wasted vote because things are getting worse for all of us in America, not better. For those of you worried I'll take votes away from the Democrat or the Republican, I say good. They deserve to lose your vote. Take as many votes as possible away from the people in both parties, keeping us in a state of perpetual war and increasing unsustainable debt. If you're ready to put your vote where your heart is, I'm not the third choice in 2016. I'm the only choice. Google me. One person and one election can make a difference. Give me your vote one time, and I'll prove it to you. Next up, we have, have Steve Kerbel. Watch his video now. A war is brewing in our country, and we need to find a way to stop it before it starts. The war is not between nations. The war is not between religions. The war is not between political parties. The war is not between races. The impending war is between the people and our government. We must derail the path towards this war, and we must do it now, because if we are not successful at avoiding this war, our nation is doomed to disastrous consequences. The problem comes down to the basic needs of the individual and the ever-increasing attacks against the individual by representatives of government. The people expect the freedom to live their lives in their chosen way, and they have an expectation of peace as long as they don't harm other people. Our country was founded on the peaceful management of government by the people, not the violent imposition of the will of government on the people. We have allowed our government to get away from us. More laws are made each year that take away more individual liberty. More activities are punishable by imprisonment, and enforcement continues to step up in intensity. Our country was founded on the principles of liberty. The people still have this fire burning in their bosom that liberty is an expected right. I recently saw a video that not only affected me deeply, it also made me consider the root of our problem as a nation. A man had his home invaded by police equipped for war. They broke down his door, they damaged his possessions, and they murdered his dog. The birth of our nation arose from the normal human desire for freedom and a new nation conceived in liberty. Liberty can only be sustained when the people have control over their government. Once government has complete control of the people, the goals of the Founding Fathers are gone and the people live in fear and tyranny. I ask my fellow Americans the following questions. Do you want peace in your life? Do you desire freedom? Do you believe that the cause of individual liberty and the peaceful desires of the people are better served with less laws? Do you desire a better future for your children and grandchildren? And lastly, a name that anyone with a computer has heard, John McAfee. 
It is near certain that the authors of America's Declaration of Independence and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, texts of agonizing beauty in the face of today's harsh realities, could not have anticipated a world in which spy cameras are hidden in cactuses, the government surreptitiously parses our verbal communications, and the concept of privacy is fast approaching extinction. They could not have anticipated a world in which information is the prime commodity of exchange at the expense of grace, compassion, solitude, and the remaining fragile components of the besieged human heart. What they did anticipate is that governments, no matter how powerful, will always hunger for more power, and that power inevitably corrupts. Governments are composed of human beings, and all of the frailties that humans possess are absorbed into those governments and become active within these governments. Hatred, anger, jealousy, fear, greed, distrust, and the whole host of afflictions that humans must bear lurk just beneath the surface of civility displayed by government. When individuals become angry with one another, an injury of some sort will likely occur. When governments become angry, entire civilizations are wiped out. When individuals become greedy, they are no longer invited to dinner. When governments become greedy, starvation afflicts the weaker nations. When people become fearful, other people avoid them. When governments become fearful, the populace is included among those elements that the government fears, and the populace has nowhere to go. These truths are self-evident to anyone who cares to look with the right kind of eyes. You can get these videos and a whole bunch of others on these three gentlemen on, on YouTube. Just get in there and, and type in their, their name. And I'll do the other three next month. Okay. In April, the members of the State Libertarian Party of Kansas will meet here in Salina for a state convention. We're very proud and happy to be, to be hosting this. We'll be at Kansas Wesley, go Yotes. <coughs> Come on out and see us. Hey, we ain't Republicans, we, we like strangers around. Okay. Next month, I'll be talking about, about the Kansas caucuses. Tell you, but also be talking about, about uh, cutting taxes. Why didn't it work for, for Brownback? Here, a young man, uh, Joey Frazier is starting a Young Libertarians Club. Come on out, talk us, talk to us about it. If you're interested, Facebook us. Uh, we'll be more than, than happy to, to get you involved. Okay. Uh, one thing, though, about the caucuses that I have to kind of point out, don't tell anybody, but... Uh, I got keys to the, the building that, that the Republicans were at. Shh, don't tell anybody. It'll be our secret. Okay. Okay. Folks, I like to have a lot of fun, as you can see. Uh, I, I love ha having a blast. Life is too short. Okay. But this year is very serious. It's very serious. We need to get problems solved. Our liberties are being eroded, and we need to take a stand. So if you say yes to that, remember, come see us at Mocha's, first Saturday of the, of the month. And we'll be more than happy to sit there and talk to you, find out your, your reasonings. We'll give you ours. We'll have a great time. Okay? And, folks, that's the, the way it is on Thursday, March the 10th, 2016. For the Sling County Libertarian Party, i got to stop. I'm out of script. Okay? May God bless.